just um hey before uh, before we even hit record we're just saying how long it's been since we saw you i think the first time we officially met i think it was down in tassie it might have been that launceston 10k because i said to jesse before i came up here to record like what are your first memories of lease and that's what she mentioned and since then uh I mean, this is a big call for, for Jessie. She's not a fan of runners, unless that runner is you. Uh, she just doesn't have as much interest in it as, as what I do. So whenever we see that there's a big result or um, whenever we see that there's a, a really impressive performance on the women's side of things, Jessie gets up and about by – actually, it's not true. It's you and Jess, you and Jess Stenson. Yeah. So she was um, – I think she was a little jealous about the fact we were sitting down and talking. But, man, eight years, it's, it's been a heck of a long time. I um, I know we've got lots to catch up on. And especially in terms of running performance, there's plenty to talk about. But how's the last month been? Because I said before I hit record as well that I, I didn't even realise you just smashed the 224 barrier with a 223.15 in Osaka. Yeah, uh, the last month's been great because I've been on break for half of that and I've been to Disney World in Tokyo and Disney Sea with Pete and Locke. And so I've certainly had a great time this last month. But, um, yeah, jokes aside, the marathon in Osaka – was something we'd uh, decided to target after Berlin and and it went really well and the training went really well and um, we can, you know, go into that a bit more detail. But I I think the key with this last month is Locke and I were wanting to do a marathon that we really enjoyed and and we did that in Berlin and then then on again to Osaka and then um, funnily enough Tokyo as well. But I think our motto at the moment with where running is for us and for the longevity that I've been able to put uh, put on the table from an athletics point of view, I think our number one thing is to have fun and enjoy what we're doing. And so we've certainly been doing that for the last 12 months. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly it gets away from you if you're not careful, isn't it? I noticed that with my own career. Like there's so many times that I would, I would look at the sport that I was a part of and go, yeah, I love it. But then I look at individual training sessions or races and go, okay, well, it's causing me a heck of a lot of stress for someone who claims to love the sport so much. So, I mean, that philosophy, it's its interesting and it, it makes so much sense. I know runners who listen to that who have been in the sport for a while would totally agree with that. But on like a practical level, how do you, level, how do you start to introduce a little more fun back into the sport or at least that mindset around fun? Yeah, I think I've, one of the reasons I've been in the sport for so long is the breaks that I've taken throughout that time, I think. Um, and and we're in those times where we've had a break, we've really had to think about whether, you know, what are we getting out of the sport and what are we getting out of the commitment to the training? Because, you know, as you're about to find out if you're going to tackle a marathon, marathon training is pretty grueling. It's, it's you know, you, you kind of don't get very many days off. you you feel tired most of the time, so it's a bit like parenting. Um, and and so add, have parenting, have work, and then have marathon training and you've got the full gamut of exhaustion. So, you know, you've really got to enjoy what you're doing each day and you've got to have a really um, clear goal in mind that you're working towards. And so each after each campaign, Locke and I have had a good break, really talked a lot about, you know, what we wanted to get out of the next, um, you know, big goal and making sure that we're really committed to that because there's been marathons where I haven't been um, mentally committed um, and if you're not mentally committed to it, then it makes it for a really rough experience. So, yeah, so that's been sort of the the way forward that we've taken in the, since, well, pretty much since Tokyo Olympics, you know, we really wanted to make sure that if we committed to another Olympic cycle that the things that we did were going to be something that we were really passionate about and, and you know, built in some really great memories. And so we've been really successful at that so far. Yeah, no, that's awesome. It's interesting as well when you speak about a philosophy like that and you see it come into practice on on such a big scale and the, one of the reasons I was pumped to catch up with you was um as I mentioned to you earlier that I, I listened to you and Matt Fox was it late last year you guys caught up for a conversation and I heard a little bit around the training and the mindset that you had going into a number of marathons and especially the form that you were in going into sort of the lockdown period um from sort of mid 2020 here in Australia until well, not really that long ago a bit over a year or a year and a half ago so it sounded as though from perhaps yours and Lockie's perspective, you knew that you're on the brink of something huge. And, and the way that you spoke about running a 223 marathon was was fairly casual uh, on the podcast, which impressed me because I was like, oh man, okay, so she's in a she's in a different place 
um, mentally than what she's been able to put on paper just yet. So I had the vibe that it was only a matter of time. So it was nice to see that get ticked off. But in terms of marathon preparation, and I want to talk a little bit about the um, the fun aspect a little bit more because I, I've found out really quickly, having been out of the sport for now, um, gee, like eight years. But yeah, but that makes sense. The last time I saw you, eight years. I've grown a human I've, since then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We've done two of them. That's um, right. It's, it's crazy. Uh, one of the things that I've learned the hard way is that your body's not just made to run these kind of Ks without pretty consistent practice. And uh, last couple of months I've been struggling just to get the ball rolling with a couple of calf strains. And even for me, getting back in, into it on like a fairly hobby level have been getting a little taste of uh, frustration and disappointment with just the interruptions that come the way. But I, I know with marathon training and distance training in general that interruption, frustration and things just not going to plan is pretty much an, an, an inevitable part of the training lead up, if not um, in a massive block, at least in individual sessions. So I was sort of keen to pick your brain around that because I saw you flying around Lake Wendere a couple of months ago. And when I see you tagging along the back of Lockie on the bike or Lachlan on the bike, I go, okay, well, there's no way that this, uh, this lady's ever had a bad run in her life because you were absolutely pumping. But I know that's not true because I've been in the sport for too long and I've had too many conversations with people like yourself where they say, yeah, look, I'm in great form. But um, in the lead up to a particular race like that, there's always sort of little things you've got to try and iron out. So was like, you know, I don't know when your official lead up to the Osaka Marathon began, whether it was eight or 12 weeks or, or something else. But can you walk us through that that lead up a little more specifically? And especially with regards to, you know, maintaining a fun attitude while navigating the frustrations of a build up? Yeah, so the campaign really probably for Target 223 um, was probably started in 2019, actually. Um, so in 2019, I had ran my PB in the half, which was, you know, just under six to nine minutes. And um, I was in pretty good shape. I wasn't training, in hindsight now, I wasn't training as well as I have been in this last uh, block. But for what I had done with the work, you know, with the work schedule I have, and with Pete, you know, we were we used to train before the pandemic at six in the morning and then start a session at six at six thirty at night and we'd get home at like, you know, eight thirty, nine o'clock by the time we'd get home from a long marathon session and we'd be, you know, working all day in you know, in the office. And so um, you know, off, the training I did back then off that kind of lifestyle was the best I'd ever, you know, put together. And I was um, thinking that running 223 was going to really happen for me in Chicago. And, you know, when I went to Chicago, everything was going well. My taper was really good. I felt amazing in the lead up. Just everything just pointed in the direction that, you know, I think this is my time. And, um, and then, unfortunately, there were three of us in the elite women's field who got some food poisoning. And so I ended up like vomiting for like 12K of the marathon, um, the last 12K of the marathon. And some strange thing that's in my mindset, obviously, because um, people said to me, why did you finish? And it's like, well, I was on track for this PV, right? And so I just went a bit more and a bit more thinking, well, maybe I'll, you know, get rid of it and then I'll be able to get back on. And, you know, um, it was a bit silly in hindsight, but um, <laughs> I think I ran like a 229 or something. Um, and, you know, I was pretty devastated uh, with that experience because I thought it was my time. Uh, and then obviously the pandemic, we had the pandemic and um, I got cut from funding from Athletics Australia because my time wasn't fast enough. And um, and so there was a whole lot of negativity that came out of that. And, you know, I got told I was, you know, I should transition out of the sport by them. And it was it was really heartbreaking. So when you come to um, you know, those crossroads, like you mentioned, or the, and the motivation, well, that, that was a pretty, you know, difficult time in my career. Um, but Locke, Dick and I were like, well, you're not tr transitioning out of anything because you're entered into the cycle women's in January and you're starting training the next day and don't worry about it, you know, let's get on with it. So thankfully having that team support, you know, I was then able to qualify for the Olympics at Osaka, um, you know, and, and that was the Osaka women's and in that race, you know, I was in still in really good shape because I hadn't really had any time off. And um, but the pacing wasn't great. There was like one group at 68.30 and then the next group was like nearly 74 minutes. So, um, you know, so 
you know, I managed to run a 226 there and get, you know, my Olympic spot. And then we all went into COVID lockdown and life changed for us all for, you know, as we know, for a couple of years. But I think the positivity out of all of that is that we both ended up working from home a lot. And so that changed our whole ability to train in a different way. And we haven't returned back to the old way where we're in the office full time. We're part, partially in the office now and we're able to prioritize training at a time that works in with all of our meetings and our commitments. And we're able to do things like work from Ballarat during the school holidays um, and stay with family. And, and like you said, where I saw you at the lake, uh, we had a really amazing training block um, over Christmas. And I think I missed like two sessions in the whole block in the lead up to Osaka. And my training was better quality, more volume, and I didn't break anything in the process. So it was a really good insight into what more I could handle given my history of injuries in the past and um, what, you know, trying not to take too many risks and, you know, keep going and keep consistent. But now I'm at a stage also where I want to do a bit more in training and I want to see what else I can do because I'm kind of at that stage now where I, I know what that level of training that I was doing, what result that was giving me, whereas now I'm finding out, well, if I can handle more, then let's give it a try and see what result we get. So it's kind of exciting because I feel like I'm starting a whole different chapter in my running career and I don't really know what my limit is uh, because I've been able to handle so much in this block. That is such a wild comment. I, I did, just to make sure I got it right, that Athletics Australia sort of started to encourage you a little bit to transition out of the sport. Like that's a that they got to surely come crawling back humbly with some phone calls and some bigger pays after that because that's just a if nothing else an absolute uh just a load of fuel to the fire of marathon training and um planning for future marathons like that, that's a weird uncomfortable conversation to have with a organization that you sort of represented pretty strongly for a long time yeah so i think you know, it was pretty heartbreaking and, you know, obviously there's only a certain funding to go around for all the athletes. And so at the time they, you know, they were making a decision on who they wanted to fund and, um, is, and, you know, it, it was very disappointing, but I, as you say, it was also motivating, um, you know, to get the letter that, you know, said that I was transitioning out was, you know, certainly not on the, the cards for what we had planned. Um, and look, it, you know, the good thing is that, we were able to keep training, prepare for the Osaka Women's Marathon and, you know, hit the qualifying time and get the opportunity to represent the country and, and move forward there. So, um, look, the, you know, that's uh, unfortunately in life we've all got, you know, to deal with um, things like that that come up and, you know, rejections and things and it's how we deal with that and how we, um, you know, move forward and, and take that as an opportunity to really motivate yourself to do something amazing is, is important. And so, you know, we're back um, focused on, you know, representing Australia again, and I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, having that opportunity hopefully very soon to to, re to continue on. So, yeah, it, it wasn't nice. And, you know, I think most people already know that story um, about what happened in that race and, and how difficult that was and what I came back to. But, you know, the good thing is, is that it also gives everybody um, an important lesson on, you know, being resilient and, and not giving up on your dreams no matter what. Yeah, for sure. What, one of the things I was interested um, to chat to you about based on the conversation you had with Foxy a little while ago was um, for, for someone who's been in the sport of marathon for so long now, you, you mentioned that like when you run a marathon, you go back to the drawing board, you'll look at different areas, what worked, what didn't, how do we change it? You said to you most recently that had been really good with the speed and volume and things. Where do you guys start when it comes to planning a next marathon? Like, What elements of your training do you break down? Are you looking purely at volume and distance? Is it session structure? Is it um, fueling and hydration? Because like, that's the one thing I've learned quite quickly in the marathon world. As opposed to 1,500 metre running, there seems to be endless um, bits of data and knowledge that you can attain, which is not just, all right, hey, run faster and longer, but all right, fuel well here, slow down here. This is a taper. This is a a heavy block it's kind of mind-blowing to me and I'm, for a bloke who's been in the sport for such a long time the marathon I still feel like I'm scratching the surface of all there is to know so I was curious just to unpack that 
a little bit with you because I, I think going back to the drawing board after a marathon, it sounds terrifying because there's so many different places you could start the, uh, the research as to what you can do better. Yeah, so I think the key is to it needs to be gradual no matter what you do. Everything needs to be gradual. You know, the way you introduce fueling needs to be gradual. The way you um, change your diet to accommodate, you know, your training requirements, it needs to be a gradual change. Um, the level of intensity that you apply week on week needs to be gradual. You know, you don't want to be increasing your load and your intensity um, in the same week uh, because that's when you'll get stress injuries. That's when your bones will break down if you're not, you know, taking in as much enough fuel to cope with the addition and training. Um, you know, there's plenty of examples of athletes who, you know, have higher um, calorie intake uh, for their chosen training and, and they're not putting in enough and they get a, you know, a stress fracture as a result. So um, all the study, all the evidence is there that everything you do when you, pre for, when you plan your full marathon build, you should be doing everything in a gradual, calm fashion and then it won't be such a shock to your body, your muscles, your fueling systems, your energy systems, and you'll be able to adapt in a nicer um, way without, you know, anxiety and panic over missing time or you know missing time I think the other thing is that we underestimate you know even elite athletes especially most of us have jobs and family and all of the things that we need to look after we tend to under fuel because we're just busy you know you've got two children you know what it's like trying to you know get you know get looking after yourself just just as a parent and um and then add the training in and you've really got to make sure you're on top of that fueling because it impacts your ability to do the training, but it also impacts your ability to stay healthy. Mm. How did you navigate that part? Because obviously uh, your, your little guys, um, it is a little boy you've got, isn't it? You, yeah, you said, Peter. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say that's awkward. I'll clarify that just now. Yeah. Um, but you said that uh, he's, he's just turned eight or he's eight years old now. I've got to see firsthand and I've even felt a little bit firsthand and you've got to be cautious as a dad talking about this because I know we don't cop it as sweet as what you guys do, but in terms of welcoming a new little life and trying to navigate just day-to-day -day life, is a, <laughs> it's a pretty huge transition. Um, so for yourself who uh, I, I can only imagine didn't take a whole heap of time off serious training or at least some form of training, it's a fair juggle. Um, one of the things that Jesse and I often laugh about is just how easy life was back Right, <laughs> kids, and how we just were so unaware of how much time we had to ourselves, which for a runner is such a beautiful thing to have. But That's right. For a new mum, is one of the most intimidating and terrifying things to fathom how you're going to get through the next few years with this little guy running around. That's right. I won't tell you that it gets busier and the goalposts change a little bit. So the don't. the time commitment doesn't change, or at least up to to eight year old anyway. I know. Or if I take myself for example, you know, at forty four, I'm still calling my parents. So you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. Look, for us, when uh, so I got a sacral stress fracture randomly in training um, uh, Christmas of twenty thirteen, and um. I was, you know, planning to run the Glasgow Commonwealth Games. And um, when I got the fracture, I said, you know, Locke and I had a chat and I was like, well, maybe this is like kind of a sign. Maybe this is the time to start a family because, you know, I won't be able to run at my best. Like, you know, I really was hoping to for Glasgow. And so, you know, it, it's a good time. Should we try for a family? And so, look, we were very fortunate that, you know, two months in and, you know, I was pregnant with Pete and, my fracture healed at the same time and, you know, everything was kind of really positive. Then we found out we had Pete coming along. And, like, I guess I've been a bit different in that when I, we decided to have a family, I didn't think about what it would be like for running afterwards. So we kind of went, if that's it for running, I'm really happy with what I've achieved in my career, but we want to have a family. And if that means I don't run another race, well, that's perfectly fine. So we were kind of pretty, pretty much at peace with, that as being a, a you know it may happen uh, and then I started to train a little bit after Pete um, I didn't do much running while I was pregnant um, you know I'm pretty short as you know um, and I was all baby in the stomach so I kind of looked like a bit of a lopsided uh, whale <laughs> but um and so running with this child that could barely fit like I was in you know, I had this, these feet and, and head and everything jammed into all these 
like crevices and I could barely eat a sandwich, let alone go for a run. Um, and so we, um, yeah, I was just kind of doing long walks with Locke and we were just enjoying really just having that time to just go for walks and see different things and not rush around and things like that. So it wasn't until, um, you know, probably about four months, I think, when I started to do some walk jogging um, after a Caesar and then uh, and then we progressed a little bit from there. But I ended up getting um, like a stress reaction in my foot pretty pretty soon after trying to start running. Um, and so that set me back a little bit. And then at about 10 months, I think I ran a half marathon in Melbourne and, and ran pretty well there. Um, and then on to, uh, it was at Houston for a marathon in January and, um, which was like 13 months after Pete and ran 227 there. So, um, yeah, like it was, it was a great, you know, a great first year as a mum really for us, because we didn't really have that pressure of going, well, I really do need to, um, you know, go back to running. Um, we did it and we found the enjoyment out of running together and, you know, getting that exercise together, you know, really all about enjoyment as opposed to performance. And it wasn't until I ran that half marathon and thought, wow, I'm still pretty fit now. Um, we'll have a crack at trying to qualify for the Olympics again. So, um, yeah, so that's sort of how it, it took place for us. Um, there wasn't that pressure, I guess, to come back so soon. Um, you know, I think people feel a bit pressured to come back early and look at other people's scenarios and want to, you know, replicate that too. But um, for us, we weren't really too worried about what other people had done and we just wanted to focus on our own story. Yeah. One thing I spoke about with Jess Stenson was how amazing it is that as distance runners, a lot of a lot of us have a reputation for being fairly OCD when it comes to not missing a day <laughs> and when it comes to making sure all the little, uh, you know, uh, I's are dotted, T's are crossed. But the idea of taking 10 months off almost completely and just doing the best you can to sort of maintain some form of fitness is in nobody's training schedule. So I was interested <laughs> to uh, hear your mindset around that a little bit because uh, not only yourself, um, but uh, I mean, there's there's endless women, but uh, on Australia, who I know personally, it's yourself and Jess have both run your fastest times coming back from giving birth. I know Jess has gone back for seconds now. Um, it, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. It's just something that blows my mind because you, just the process of even taking close to a year off training, it, it's still hard to wrap your head around how you can maintain or, or build back fitness to a degree that you were um, you, you sort of far more ahead of where you were previously. That was a lot of words, but I hope that made sense. Yeah, look, I think um, it's not proven. There's no science behind it, as to my knowledge. But I certainly feel like um, the breaks that you have then give you the opportunity to reset. They give your body a chance to recover and heal. Um, and they give you that opportunity to say, hey, do I really want to do this anymore because this I put myself through this grueling program you know day in day out sometimes I get up and I don't want to do it and you know because it's like I'm exhausted already and then I'm going to layer more you know you have those moments and and of course you know you you either have your work pressures and you know or you have your I want to start a family pressure or you have your actual children to look after you know depending on which stage of your life you're at so you've always everyone's always got their thing that are you know that is weighing them down and you know and and taking um, you know, taking energy and, and, you know, needing your, your full attention. And so regardless of where you're at in your life. And so I think the blessing of childbirth is that it's forcing us to actually have a rest, to reset, to, to, you know, recover, and then to make a commitment to that next vision. So whether or not it's all about this thought of, you know, it's about, you know, superhero mother, baby making, hormone or whatever it may be I don't know like there's obviously something in that there but I think if I look at the last you know eight years since having Pete surely I don't have any of those superpowers left because he's eight years old now so um but I'm still running fast so um I think that's more to do with all of the breaks I've had and that, those resets than actually having the child if that makes sense because you you know you know what it's like you've got two so and all of the mums and dads that are out there know how busy you are as a parent um, and so like, you know, that's got to take away from a bit of your recovery as well. So I, I just think that it's probably about how we think and approach running differently now that we're parents, um, and, and the pressure and we kind of take a bit of the pressure off perhaps. 
Yeah. Has rest been a big part of your training over the years previous to Peter? Like, do you have rest days or do you have rest periods during the year? Yeah, yeah, we do. And I think that's really key um, because you just can't keep just going and going. I mean, I would never have been going for, you know, all of these Olympic cycles if I had, a, you know, hadn't have taken a rest and stopped and, and really decided, you know, what's next and what I want to achieve. And also having the the work, like I have a professional career as well. And so I need those moments in, you know, to have a break from the, the grueling training and to be focusing on a goal that's related to my work as well. So it's nice to have those um, you know, those I see a race is like a mini project, and so it's nice to have that little mini project. And that project goes live. You know, that's your race day, and then I can then focus on something else. And it may or may not be running related. It may be something to do with my work or Peach or family and things like that. So mm. you know, to stay in this sport for such a long time, I think you've got to also be okay with not being relevant as well for periods of time you know you might just take a break for a while and that's okay and you know keep your fitness going and um but remember that there's always another london or there's always another gold coast or there's always you know another launceston you know we have these amazing races and opportunities to do in our career um but we don't have to do them all all the time we can give ourselves a bit of a rest and and then um tackle it the following year so i think that's been kind of a blessing as well yeah, awesome. I was listening to Elliot Kipchoge speak a while ago about the month after his marathon. He says he does next to nothing, like some very light aerobics, maybe some walking, some very, very easy jogs towards the end of it. Um, as I said, I'm a fairly new customer, a customer, especially when it comes to marathon recovery. Like that's something I haven't even thought about yet because my main focus is just getting to marathon start. <laughs> <laughs> you got the recovery coming? recovery <laughs> coming. <laughs> but um, from your perspective, what it was uh, – pretty much a month to the day that you ran your marathon. Is that right? Like, Yeah, I think right? so. Yeah. I can't remember like myself. Like, yeah, is, almost. Yeah. What, what does that recovery period look like for you? I know the shoe technology has been really interesting in terms yeah. of how quickly athletes are finding themselves back up on their feet and feeling pretty smooth. I spoke to Matt uh, four days after he had run, I think he ran a soccer. Yeah. Didn't he? Like he, yeah. yeah. I spoke to Matt four days after he ran that. And he's like, yeah, I feel good. I feel fantastic. He's like, I know I'm not recovered uh, yeah. 100%, but my body feels pretty good. I'm smooth. For you, like, is there a pretty standard recovery process that you go through throughout the few weeks after a marathon? Yeah, well, this one was a bit different, but yes, definitely is sort of, you really, well, I find that with my life is that I tend to just come back and I start working. And so instead of running, I just work more. <laughs> that pretty much is my recovery. <laughs> Um, and so that just naturally slots in. So I end up feeling like I'm busy anyway, um, of just, you know, using the energy in a different way. But, um, yeah, this one was a little bit of a, um, different experience because I went on and then, um, we had three days in Tokyo, Disney. Um, we took Pete to Disney and we had, look, we had the luxury. We booked a hotel that had a pool. And so, um, we spent every afternoon, the three of us in the pool just mucking around you know just playing kid games and um, and that really helped my recovery um so I would recommend you know just not doing anything like pool running or anything you know that you'd normally do as an injured athlete just doing things that are just fun with the kids you know and because then you're just moving around the water you're running and chasing them in the water you just you know and you're getting that blood flow and toxins out so that was really a positive thing um I felt pretty good after Osaka, which was really good um, because it meant the training worked. So it meant that all the training we put in, um, you know, that I really um, hit hit the right mark. So that was a positive there, recovering really well. Um, I think the thing that I struggled with in the recovery was more around like your, uh, my stomach didn't feel as great, and you know, because you eat all these carbs and you, you know, you're eating all this stuff that's kind of like a bit boring and a bit like the same and your body's not having as much fiber and as much you know green veg and all that stuff that kind of keeps you you know your stomach in check um so later in the week and then obviously went to tokyo disney and probably didn't eat the best so um <laughs> so adding to that you know my stomach was probably more impacted than my actual legs um because i was unable to run tokyo the following week and um and survive that but didn't 
feel bad in the legs. I just felt really a bit funny in the stomach. So, Mm. um, yeah, so I guess the message there is like, you know, a bit of water stuff is really helpful. And then on top of that, you know, really get on to the nutritional aspects and, you know, have fun because you don't want to be too boring um, when you're trying to celebrate a a PB and a marathon um, completion. But also make sure you add a bit more veggie in there and other things. Um, and maybe don't run a marathon seven days after a marathon either. <laughs> it's a bit crazy. I'm going to pick your brains about that in just a moment. But before I forget, um, so speaking about nutrition uh, going into the race, like you said that there's not a whole heap of uh, veggies and greens and things going into the body as a pretty heavy co- focus on carbs. Is, is that the week out is that a couple of weeks out or is that just something you feel more comfortable with in like a month leading up to a marathon oh no definitely not a month no no that's just like the couple of days so you're talking you know thursday night yeah friday saturday um you want to keep everything as simple as possible you know keep things you know no not a lot of fiber just just very plain carbohydrates that are gonna you know sit in your muscles and go to your liver and be ready to be used as fuel so you don't want anything and in particular after my experience at chicago um you know there was nothing that i ate even in that block that you know really was odd or anything like that but i still got um food poisoning so i think it's really important to you know be on top of you know what you're eating and what you're putting in for those few days because you know you can do all this training and then it will just turn south when um if you just eat the wrong thing so we, we kept things pretty simple you know you're eating rice bubbles you're eating plain rice you're eating um you know oh uh, we we do eat a bit of miso soup and things like that when you're in japan just to create some flavor and a bit of salt and things like that um you know and then i would keep like lunches is where you'd add a bit of salad and and chicken and things like that but generally for those two days you're eating a lot of rice and um you don't want to see too much rice after after your yeah. three days of carbo- <laughs> carbohydrate I can, learning. I can imagine that's true. I can imagine that's true. What, yeah. So pre is pre-race breakfast your, your rice bubbles? Um, depends where I am. If I have the ability to get some um, some non-fiber bread, you know, just white bread, um, then I'll just stick to, you know, a, a piece of bread with some jam or honey if I can get access to that it, you know sometimes you're in an, a situation like if you're in a team where you've got access to pretty much anything so you know at a food hall but there's other times where you're in a hotel room and you you know barely got access to breakfast so you know rice bubbles with no milk is fine um, um, but you know some people couldn't even eat dry rice bubbles so um, you know it really depends on taste as well but for me you know a piece of bread is fine um, because I'm not really worried about eating the morning of the marathon. Um, I, I, it, by that stage, if I haven't fueled properly, then it's too late. So it's really about depending on what time your marathon actually starts. And, you know, if, you, if your marathon's not starting till sort of mid-morning, then you'll probably want something just so you're not feeling hungry. But um, all your fueling has to have been done already in the, in the few days leading up. So, mm. you know, really that piece of bread is just about not feeling hungry in the morning. Yeah, sure. Now, this marathon a week later, it's very interesting. I'm on my way there. Um, in terms of recovery, things like that, you gave me a pretty strong nod when we mentioned the shoe technology and how much that has improved the recovery time. What are you running in when you're uh, lining up on race day? What shoes have you got on? Yeah, so I wear the ASIC Sky Plus. And so, yeah, they've been great. I have I train in the ASICs Nova Blast for most of my sessions and then for anything where I want to get an indication of um, you know, marathon pace or speed, then I'll put my skies on as well to just get an idea of to how things are going. Um, but generally, most of my training's in the Nova Blast. And they have been amazing. Like they've got, you know, all the cushioning and they feel pretty light. So, you know, I can do pretty good sessions in, in the Nova Blast and sort of just extrapolate those um, times to, you know, what I want to be running in the marathon or in the 10. And then the skies, um, you know, each iteration they've, made big improvements i'm hearing there's some another improvement coming in time for about this time next year um so in time for the olympics definitely for next year um and you know i think that might be their third version uh and they you know that it sounds like they're um they've made some uh tweaks to them to you know in line with the testing that some of the elite athletes have been providing so um yeah th- these shoes 
you know, they've been around since I think 2016 is when we first sort of noticed them popping on the scene um, when, you know, Nike produced their first version. And, um, you know, I think some of the athletes had them at the 2016 Olympics, but others didn't get them. And so, um, you know, that it certainly wasn't a level playing field back then, but I think it's exciting now that, you know, regardless of what brand you're wearing, you've got access to a shoe that is going to help you train better, race faster and recover faster. Um, you know, and that certainly, um, you know, helps people with the longevity, you know, stopping, stopping us from getting so many stress fractures and, you know, muscle tears and things like that. You know, it's pretty exciting that the technology is um, keeping everyone running because that, you know, helps participation, enjoyment and, um, you know, keeps people doing what they love. Yeah, that was one of the things that I finished up in 2014. And when I started to get more involved in the coaching element of it a few years ago, I was so overwhelmed by shoes. And to be honest, like I haven't looked as closely at shoe technology as what I have for the last six months because I'm now needing to pay a bit more attention to it. But I used to just, I used to be a big ASICS fan as well. I think they were the ASICS GT 1000s were my favorite trainer. I'm not sure if I'm telling you the right name there, but they had like a little bit of midsole support and I just had a really good run in them in terms of injuries and just feeling good running. So I was always loyal. And then I came back and couldn't find them. I was like, I'm so confused (laughs) about where to look. Um, Tell me about this second marathon. So it was the mindset to go and have a a double crack. I know you said Osaka was the main focus. Were you going out to race uh, in Tokyo or what was the mindset behind what you were doing? Yeah, so I wasn't going out to necessarily race. I think originally I had an invitation for uh, through ASICS um, in the sub elite category to run Tokyo, and this is, um, uh, you know, it was a good opportunity to meet all of the ASICS team and and to be part of such an amazing event. Um, and in the meantime, I was also given an invitation to run in the elite field at Osaka, and so um, my one of my close friends, um, Claire, she was down to run Tokyo herself. And so and she was in the elite field. So, you know, I said to her, look, if I feel fine and recover fine, I'll, um, I'll pace you, you know, and I'll see if I can pace you for as long as I can. Um, and so that's how it started. And we'd sort of booked all of our trip around doing that and going to Disney in between. And, you know, and so the focus was to run fast at Osaka. And then the focus at Tokyo was to pace Claire um, and finish hopefully and get my fifth star. So I only had Boston left to run to complete all the majors. And so, you know, that's what we set out to do. But then um, Claire had a, um, and a little injury that kept her out of training for a little while over the break. And so she decided it was, she probably needed more time. Um, and then we were kind of thinking, well, you know, I really want to help, you know, be part of the ASICS, um, you know, uh, celebration and, the launch of the shoe and all of that. So we'll, um, I'll run a soccer and then we'll see how I feel. And so when it came to the Saturday before the race, you know, I was attending all of the meetings and I'd been drug tested like three times, I think in this process. And so I was doing all these things, you know, and look, I really would have loved to have been able to, you know, help pace some of the elites, you know, and things like that. But we were pretty excited about, you know, just having that opportunity to be part of such an amazing event. You know, it's huge, Tokyo. But I guess one of the things that I didn't think about in being in the front line is that, you know, they would be going out so fast. And so it was lucky that I had legs that were pretty recovered. Um, and so therefore, I just went, had to go out with the pace that everyone went, in, you know, in because it was just like a stampede as, you know, the start of a world major with uh, such, uh, you know, amazing athletes around the world would uh, would go out in. So, I think my my first 5K, which also the addition of that is there's a couple of turns you have to do and then a bit of it is downhill in the first 5K. So, uh, yeah, so I set out at a pace that I had not intended to necessarily run for the first 5K um, and then settled in with a group um, and ran with them for most of the time. And then it wasn't until sort of, I guess, the last 10K, I think, where my stomach did feel a bit ordinary. And so I kind of was just running along. And then I saw some Australians that I know who were running in the other waves and they were like running past and we were yelling out to each other and, you know, and things like that. So it was a pretty cool experience because 
you know, I'm usually running something where I'm so like focused on this time and I must get this time and you put so much pressure on yourself. But it was really nice to experience it from a completely different perspective and just be going there to experience the event and just see, you know, everyone's passion for, you know, completing the marathon. And so, yeah, really glad I did it and I've recovered really well from it. But um, it was a bit of a risk. And uh, But I'm really glad that I did something a bit rebellious because I'm not usually very rebellious. <laughs> if you call that being a rebel anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rebel in marathon talk. I love yeah. it. So that, what was that first 5K? What was your finish time? Oh, I think my first 5K was like, oh, it might have even been – close to 17 minutes it might have even been just under 17 and then um I went through and halfway in around 73 um but I ran 231 so (laughs) it was totally crazy but um yeah but it's pretty fun in the end isn't that crazy I would love to know I don't know if there's a record on this but it'd be interesting to know what the the best uh double would be like within a seven day period for a woman surely you're up there in the ranks like there wouldn't be too many people have gone out and done that well, I'd be hoping not too many because it's a bit of a crazy stunt. And I probably don't really recommend it, but <laughs> <laughs> hopefully no one's as crazy as me to have actually tried it. <laughs> oh, that's unbelievable. Lise, I know uh, we're, it's getting late here. I've got a few more minutes, but before I, I wrap it up, I was keen to pick your brain a little bit about what's on the horizon for you. Have you already started to look at next marathons or next lead-ups or what does sort of the next six months look like for, for you guys? Yeah, so I've got to make a decision in the next, like, I think, 10 days about whether I nominate for world championships. Um, so it's a little challenging for us because it's going to be another warm championship and I'm not sure I'll be able to go and spend, you know, three months somewhere warm um, this year and then do that again for the Olympics next year. So we're grappling with a decision around that at the moment and so that will continue for the next 10 days until the nomination period ends. Uh, but in the meantime, where I've just sort of started a little bit of an introduction to workouts again, uh, very small, you know, just a, a few three minutes and things like that, just to start to get the body ready. Um, and then um, going to be running as an ambassador for the runaway Noosa Half Marathon in May. Uh, and so I'll be doing that as my first event and then on to try to run a PB at the Gold Coast um, Half Marathon in the middle of the year. And we'll probably pick a 10 in there as well, but we'll just get, you know, get those main ones down in the calendar and then plan around that. Yeah, awesome. Oh, it's so good to catch up with you. I know it's been been such a long time. I'd love to uh, touch base with you again, maybe after your next marathon or whenever you've got a little bit of a, a, a little bit of break in your hectic schedule. It was uh, certainly making up for lost time. And if I, um, I'll shoot you a message because we spent a bit of time up in Ballarat as well because Jesse's family lives there and there's oh, no lovely. doubt I'm going to yeah. be uh, looking for a training partner of some sort on one Perfect. weekend. So if, yeah. uh, if you're yeah. lucky or happy, I'll have to sneak up with you on a Sunday morning or something. Yeah, reach out. Yeah, he's pretty good on the bike these days. He's been doing the easy runs with me and then uh, the bike when I'm doing a workout. So, um, yeah, more the merrier, that's for sure. Man, he's, you've done so well there. He's been the ultimate training partner for so many years now. He has, he has. He's, he's pretty good. He's a really good man, yeah. And awesome. he gives good massages too, so I think oh. that helped me recover. Oh, what a king. That's yeah. awesome. Please, hey, thank you so much. I'll leave you to it and uh, yeah, we'll chat again soon. Lovely. Thanks, Jason. Bye. See you later. See everybody.